podcast podcast number 30 for us and this one is going to be really fun because I got Bill Seamantle and anybody that knows anything about big bass and big baits for bass will know this name Bill Seamantle and if you're a, a fly fisherman you're probably not going to know too much of the name but you're going to want to listen up because Bill Seamantle is a freshwater fishing hall of fame the youngest youngest to be indicted into the uh hall of fame is a legendary angler he's uh he's a big bass teaching advocate um he's built so many baits he's he's basically a genius when it comes to designing <laughs> baits and hooks and the stuff that he's done um it's just it, it is really legendary like we're getting a good laugh here if you're if you're just gonna watch this you know we're just kind of joking around but not really He's a super badass stud. So anyway, this week's episode, Wild Fish, Wild Places, Behind the Scenes. It's going to be fun. I got to have you as my announcer. It's like, bring on the boom or here comes the boom, you know, walking into it. <laughs> here comes the boom, baby. Man, you threw some stuff out there, dude. That, oh, I that's true. for my wife and say, hey, I am. <laughs> See, I am cool, cool baby. Yeah. So for for. You know, we're just going to kind of dive right into this thing. And Bill, um, you said you started big bass, uh, big bass bait fishing when you were 15 years old, right? Like you kind of started. I didn't, well, I, you never started, but I remember when I was really young, you know, growing up here in Southern California, um, it was really cool because this is a byproduct of pops. You know, dad, we fished, we hunt, we did a lot of stuff. But I was that crazy kid when he was at the lower lake um, trolling a little needle fish for trout because we, we, were, we were the type of people with our funding, you know, the amount of money we had. We had to do a lot of fishing and hunting for food. Right. You know, that was part of our survival rate back in the days because we didn't have a lot. Um, so when dad was out there trolling, you know, needle fish for trout, I was the crazy kid that was putting on big lures on lead lines at the lower lake. And uh, I remember my dad just shaking his head in our little 14 foot Valco. Um, with an electric motor going. I had one of those. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what are you doing, kid? And I go, I'm going to catch something big. And I was I was seeing things different even at a young age at that part. And uh, about 1985, uh, these these guys up the Lake Pyramid, um, California, not the one in Nevada, they were making these wood plugs. And it was really cool. You know, we're like, oh, man, they're doing these things for stripers. And they're making them out of oars. So I was learning how to make wood plugs for my first big you'd say ac style because that's the most known but it wasn't ac at the time you know he didn't come around for a while but uh they showed us how to make them and dad and i dad would go home and cut legs off the chairs <laughs> <laughs> they're making them out of chair legs but 1985 was the start when i started doing it and catching fish not just stripers but i was lead lighting those dang big wood plugs at cast eight catching 10 pound fish when i was a kid and that opened up another avenue. Once you, it's really weird that Pandora box, when you open something up that no one's really thinking of, um, it turns a light bulb on. And in doing that, man, I I was going down the shore at the lower lake, uh, like in my teens, with the ocean rod, with big vinyl jigs, with big sassy shads and and trying different techniques. And um, the, the whole industry, was basically at such an infant style state. You know, nobody was really doing it, just a handful of guys, the old school guys um, that were big fish fishermen, the Croupies and the Harrisons and Masons and all the guys that were doing more like crawdad fishing, you know, uh, Harry the Hat and stuff. But I was the guy going behind him, the kid. And then, and I graduated. So when I went from the 14 foot Balco with my dad, man, I really upgraded to a nine foot blow, blow up sea eagle. <laughs> I, I, we yeah, love sea eagles yeah i i fished at cast Ake, the big lake and the little lake and a nine foot blow up you know trolling trolling wood plugs with lead line and, and crawdad fishing and doing all kinds of stuff so to say the least i've been around for quite a while and a lot of the companies i've helped through the years you know with cast Ake starting and huddleston and sean donovan who just passed away with optimum uh he was a big big influence on the industry with any bait that has an internal jig head inside a swim bait 
you know, a lot of that came from Sean Donovan. And I was there in the beginning with him down at the shores at the lower lake at Cass Steak. And, and then time started happening, man. You know, the people, <laughs> more and more people came in and, you know, you had the old wood plug cast steaks and we were selling wood table legs, dad and I, for 300 bucks. You know, mom would, <laughs> mom would come in and look at a, a chair from a table and the chair would have three legs on it. <laughs> oh, your, your dining room table had the Bible stuck under all the legs of the chair. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> That's no joke. Because some wood and, you know, ash and, you know, the, the cedar, um, each one had a play. But I remember doing a bunch of stuff doing that, watching dad. They called him Bucket of Lures. And he used to walk down the lower lake and upper lake and people would pay three. You know, you hook a, a 15, 20 pound striper pyramid, people would give their arm and leg. And they're like, uh, my dad would say 300 bucks because he's a salesman. Yeah. And people would all put their money together and buy a stupid table leg for 300 bucks. Um, <laughs> So it built this huge uh, community. It wasn't huge like in the U.S., but like for California and certain areas, the pods, it built this community of these crazy guys in their garage building their lures, their own stuff. And, and as it progressed, it got more and more expensive. And what I saw, even at a young age, is we priced, we outpriced the fishermen, the grassroots people um, of being able to enjoy what we're doing or even try it because some some guy in Texas or or Mississippi or Alabama you you name it they would never pay three hundred dollars on a wood plug back in right. the day right you're, you're nuts so that's when I hooked up with uh, Spro over fifteen years ago and they said hey what's the biggest thing the industry really needs to do and I said we need to give good quality baits that are the big baits at a better price point and open the industry the the big bait industry up to everybody. And that was one of the biggest things I think that uh, I was pretty happy to be a part of because in doing that, people got confidence in using a bait that was affordable. And then when they got hooked and it's no different of a hunter, you know, going out and buying an old 1100 Remington or then go, man, I need to upgrade to a pigeon grade 101 Winchester, <laughs> which is like $4,000 more. But it, it gave them ideas and concepts of confidence. And now you see guys doing lures, you know, big bait stuff, swim baits all over the U.S. from big companies down to the little guys in, the, in, their, in their garages. And everybody's selling product at all kinds of prices. You can still right. find lures out there for 300 bucks. Oh, I saw some at the ISC show that were those Roman, Roman lures that were pushing $1,000 each, you know, $750, $800. I mean, yeah crazy numbers but when the when you when we're going to bring that spro better price point big bait to the market was part of that transition to to a uh, plastic was that was what made it because the design was still there you guys i but it was a plastic bait versus a wood bait is that why it was a little bit more yeah there's a, there, yeah there's a lot in when you start doing custom woods and i mean i i did all that stuff when i was a kid humidity the grain of the wood um we used to use a yellow alaskan cedar it was a tight grained um it didn't swell as much didn't absorb as much water held good paint <clears throat> but it became so hard to find you can't even find that stuff to carve on anymore um so the components getting it was one thing but to make it durable and last was another thing so when you look at all this stuff that i've learned through all the years and then recently a door to open up with fish lab. You know, I just left another company just in January and everybody who knows me knows me. And then there's people that don't, but I've been around for a long time and I love fishing. It doesn't matter if it's crappie fishing or, you know, going out chasing, you know, yellowtail or white sea bass, <clears throat> but I'm known for catching big fish, big bass. It's very rare when you're able to go into a company and we could talk about this a little bit later. And this goes into everything that we're talking, hunting, fishing, you know, archery shooting. It's finding a company that is all encompassing, which is a system. So when you have like Akuma, which is a rod and reel company, then you have, you know, they picked up the soft steel line. Then they bring up, you know, fish labs with what Mike Bennett did the last few years in 2018. And a door opened up where I was able to come in and be part of a team 
to mix everything that I've learned in the last, you know, 25, 30 years and be able to build stuff. We get to do stuff now that every other company that I've ever been with before, I've never been able to, that, you know, they come in and they go, Bill, what do you got? You know, and I sit down with Mike and I open up these pages of designs I've had for like 25 years and Mike's looking at them and he's going, why hasn't this come out? <laughs> other people never saw the vision. All right. You know, you, you have to understand the vision. It's like when I was saying, when you're a kid trolling a big wood plug behind dad with the, you know, he's trolling for trout. I was just in a different category and it's so cool coming to fish lab, sitting down with Mike Bennett and you start talking to him and here's, here's how it worked out with Mike Bennett. He, and I love the guy. So I met him a few years back. He won best of shows from another company he was working with. I won best of shows, not only for lures, but for hook designs. So now you got two crazy guys sitting there looking at each other and we're down there at a Kuma <laughs> place and something came up. I saw a striper out in the office and it's this massive striper. I love striper fishing. <laughs> and I go, whose is that? And Mike goes, it's mine. I go, what? I go, my biggest from the shores of Castic was 35 pounds. I'm like proud. Did we just become best friends? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like like stepbrothers. But I, go, I go, I got a 35 pounder. And Mike just put me down. He smacked me down and he goes, Well, I got a, that's a 50. Oh, and he goes, but I got like three over 50. And instantaneously I hated him. Like, yeah, yeah, like, oh like going, you son of a bitch. Yeah. He, he turned around and we started looking at Instagrams and photos, and I'm I'm looking at the big brown trout he caught, which I grew up in the Sears, and you laugh that people might not know me fly fishing. <laughs> I grew up fly fishing, building my own fly rods at eight, and nine years old. <laughs> I, I fly tie, you know, I tied flies uh. for like 15 years and he's looking at the big Browns and then he's looking at my, you know, white, you know, um, uh, yellow tail. And I'm looking at his blue fin and, and it just clicked with, it, it was so quick and the gears meshed so, so great that when you see that opportunity, and you know it too, when you see somebody that has the same passion in fishing, oh, yeah. not single-minded, because a lot of companies out there are one-trick ponies. Right. And that's the biggest thing that you got to really, when you look at a company, you look at bait and product and who's designing it, are they just designing a bait to get a bait out there? Or are they the guys out there that's going to use the bait, understand it, understand why fish hit baits? angles uh you know trajectories um the pitch and yaw and how it swims all these things to create more bites and then you got two guys being able to bounce it off each other that love fishing in general mm -hmm. that means our crossover and i think that's what people don't understand yet when they see fish lab and you have freshwater inshore offshore fish lab within a, you know two years three years They've already built three segments within the industry, which a lot of companies and people don't understand. The West Coast, we're at a special place that within an hour, you can be out fishing bluefish tuna, bluefin tuna, and then you can come in an hour and go fish for a largemouth bass and another 45 minutes past that, catch big brown trout up in the Sierras. So we are able to understand a bigger patch of fishing from saltwater to freshwater and everything between. And Fish Lab is now going to be able to actually help all the anglers across the U.S. Because we're going to be multi, you know, faceted where, you know, it might be wintertime right now, uh, you know, back east somewhere. Well, we have baits to help you catch bigger fish and more fish at a great price point with Fish Labs. But now you want to go down and you want to travel down to Florida. Well, man, just go get a couple hydroglides and go down there and start throwing the, the big swim baits that we have and catch some monster largemouth. Oh, wait, you want a bio spoon? Put that on and go catch some big redfish. Right. You, want to go, you want to go out in the ocean, north or east or west? Put the bio flyer on, hook it on a mackerel, and hook a monster bluefin or a selfish. Yeah, so, exactly. It's got the, you've got the depth. It's oh, got yeah. the depth with all the stuff. And and uh, and that's one of the things that's been fun with me, too, talking with everybody is the, the different baits. And like you said, how – uh, you know, we've got the, the bio flyer. I mean, that thing is wicked cool, you know, and then we're talking about wake baits and then you're talking about, I saw the spoon, you know, the, the redfish, you know, spoon that they came out with. I mean, okay. That bio spoon, that's the, what people don't understand what Mike did with, with fish lab did with the team did. And this is all the anglers that are helping fish lab. I mean, 
talking to Davey and, and Mike, there's a group of anglers across the U.S. and every state that are professionals in their own mind, in their own right, in their areas. Right. But, hey, guys, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're needing. And then you got two crazy fishermen over at Fish Lab and go, we know exactly what they're saying. We know exactly what they're talking about. Let's start building baits. That little spoon that they're going to fish redfish for, hold on to your horses because you're going to go up to the California Delta and throw that same spoon with a little twister tail on the back and catch a 10-pound largemouth in a tournament and win 100000 bucks. <laughs> and for me, if I, when I saw that, I mean, that's going to be a huge pike a pike oh. killer, like one of the one of the top baits ever is one of those the Johnson weedless spoon, right? Like for big pike, because you know the same reason that it catches bass and redfish. They live in the weeds. They live in some cover. Those spoons get in the middle of it and crush fish. Right, and when you look at product like older product too, the biggest thing in the fishing industry, if you're a historian, like even the, the old wood plugs that we did. I mean, I could pull up on my phone right now, and I don't know if they would actually even see it, but the biggest thing is everybody goes, hey, Bill, you're back in the day when people did um, stuff like, you know, the AC style plugs and, you know, the jointed wood plugs. And I laugh, and you're, I don't know if you're going to be able to pull this up, but my dad and I worked at Swap Meet, right? That's how we made a lot of money. We sold sporting goods, golf to archery to shooting to fishing, and we did a lot of antique lures. So say the AC style plug came out in like the 1990s, right? Well, when we were building the plug, dad and I were laughing. There's a plug out there in 1935. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that. I can see it lifted up a little. Yeah. If everybody, uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can see this on the YouTube channel. But that yeah. that right there was. 1938. Yep. Wow. So it was a zigwag. So it was exactly the same plugs that we were making out of wooden chairs. You know, 50, yeah. 60 later and a lot of people are claiming as their own our forefathers dude they were freaking geniuses uh, yeah, everything that you could think of they had minimally nothing back then and they thought of everything so when you look at product the biggest thing is building a better mass mousetrap so there's stuff out there that kind of works that has a great idea but needs the better hooks the better we a uh, weedless design um the better um pitch and yaw how it floats and how it works through the water column and that's the neat thing about what Fish Lab's doing. We understand that. And we might take something that had almost a good idea that could have been completely money. Uh -huh. Mike and I get to tweak some stuff at it and, and do it and go out there and start laughing. And for me, it's going to be cool because I know I'm going to have this product for about a year. No yeah. one's going to have it. I'm going to use it in the tournaments. So gonna... <laughs> and you get to really try it out. I get to well, really try it out and say, you... aha. You're talking about the the you know the old school days that our our forefathers of the fishing legends when about I don't know probably eight years or so ago now we actually got to hang out and fish with um, Enzio Rapala in Finland and we got to hear stories of how his dad Lowry learned we actually went to the island there was a hermit named Toivu Puvalainen that lived on this island and he taught Lowry and the family how to carve those rapala lures out of balsa and birch bark and where it was conceived basically by this uh hermit that lived out on the island with you know they would have to take a boat we i mean it was a long boat ride out on this island on this lake and we got to see the old factory where they started the old house where mom and dad and brothers and sisters are woodland lures and and like you said, like that stuff has all been done for the most part. And now we're, we're into the, you know, technology age and we're able to take those old school designs and put our spins on them and make them better, make them swim better. But like you said, the, the pitch and yawn is what you called it where the, yeah. the baits it, are it's a huge difference. Yeah. Th th this is realistic. That's lifelike. And that is not understanding your weight value. For, you know, for your, your ballast and it's off, but one will create more wake and bubbles and one's more realistic. So understanding that and knowing how to position weights within a bait. But like I said, that came back, you know, years ago, people were working on this stuff. And, and the crazy part, one time I, I was asked one time, because they're going, oh, Bill, you don't really carve. I have carved. I mean, even Mike saw some of my carvings of, you know, 
glide baits that I did almost 15, 20 years ago that I actually have a whole photo series of me doing it back at the fire station. But I look at that and I go, yeah, there's some traditionalists that those are the guys that they're in their own little category. But if you're going to take, say, six months to carve a bait, perfect, weight it and everything else, I'm a realistic kind of guy. I want to go fishing. Yeah, yeah I so, want six months worth of fishing. <laughs> right. All so right. if I have a CAD machine and I could sit there and I could just do one side of a fish and draw it up and we could put in a CAD machine and pop out the side and make it hydrodynamic and bring up the height a little bit and you know, trim down the belly and place it and do it all on a CAD machine and make this thing bulletproof. You know, that's where technology is helping the anglers also, because now they're going to be able to get baits from fish lab. They're going to be able to go out and get a, a good top water, you know, rattling frog or a bio shad or bio wake bait at a price point that's not breaking the bank. And you know, it's, it's built, it's built well. And it's backed by a company that if there's any issues, you call us and we take care of it. I mean, yeah, for sure. Okuma and Fish Lab are, and Soft Steel, all of it is all good. It's a small, it's a small, big company, right? Like that's yeah. how we like uh, like to refer old, to old school family. Yeah, old school family for sure. And it and they've obviously by bringing you into the mix, you know, you just keeping that keeping that going. What's so for in the black sheep? I I'll, I just have that feeling. You have all these guys working together and they should, you know, that like my mind's like always going and you know, they're just looking at me like this and going, what did we just do? <laughs> this guy's up 24 seven thinking the drawings, the concepts. Uh, oh yeah. I'm, I'm a wreck. And yeah. I know I'm going to be the one that's like, they're going to shake their head like, Oh, here comes Bill again. He's that's all right. That's, that's a, that's me too, man. Always grinding on stuff not so much as the uh, the actual design and building of lures a little bit but um so the big bass zone let's want to touch on that real quick because i don't know much about that so it was was that your baby you started that yeah so uh years ago you know working with all these lure companies and i've helped a lot of people through the years um a good friend of mine mike jones who the bass master senior editor uh we fished together and i, I remember doing bass masters way back in the day and uh, I think I won Bassmasters in 97 at Powell. And Jones is one of the editors right there and writers. And I showed him some big fish I had. I caught quite a few big ones over 10 pounds. And he was one of those guys that, you know, just looked at me and went, ah, bullshit. You know, he's like, because there's, there's a stigma on guys doing big baits and catching big fish. There's, there's a lot that are not truthful. You know, people do some silly stuff to try to be at the top of the hill. And I'm just a different cat. So Mike and I uh, sat down and I took him fishing for a couple of years, put him in the boat and showed him my theories of catching, you know, swim bait fish and tube fishing and fishing a fat fly, a little teeny bait for big fish. And, and he was in the boat watching it happen. And, and another good friend of ours, George Kramer, who's, you know, in the hall of fame for riding down here in Southern California he called me up one time and this is the, this is the most impactful thing I heard from two guys. George called me up one time after I caught a monster fish at the lower lake. It was a 198. I won this big tournament for the, the biggest fish that year in California. Wow. And I kept quiet and he goes, Bill, he goes, I want to ask you something. He goes, you do not tell anybody what you're doing. And I go, no, I'm not going to work hard for 20 years and giving away in 20 minutes. <laughs> and he goes, here's your problem. He goes, you're going to die one day. And you're not going to be able to leave anything for the next generation because all the stuff running around your head, he goes, it's going to be gone and no one's going to be able to know what you, all the hard work you put in. And that really kind of hit me impactfully. So, uh, shoot, I think within the next day or two, Jones came up and said, Hey, we need to write a book. So the book was the big bass zone. So that's where the BBZ came from. Nice. So we started writing it probably about 2002, 2004, and it came out in 2005. And, uh, if you read the book, it's it's not just about big bait fishing. It's about the mindset of putting yourself, you know, most of the time you're a hunter. I can look behind your wall and I see your ducks and stuff. So I, I you're a hunter. You position yourself to kill things and ambush stuff and everything else. You are no different than a bass. And this is what I was trying to explain to Mike too, is we create the illusion of realism to make the bass think that it's accomplishing its goal. So when I throw baits, I'm not a hunter. Like most guys go out, I, I hunt for big fish. I'm the prey. I'm really looking at how do I position myself? What bait, what bait do I use that I know the fish is going to push 
So I never bring in a bait just to, you know, have a fish follow it. I'm bringing in a bait that the fish is pushing it into a funnel, creating directional changes, creating a flare, having the right shadow effect. Um, and I just, I just changed the look of where you're looking instead of through the, your eyes. I'm trying to always look through the eyes of a bass. And when you do that, boom, lights change. And, and like I said, when Mike saw that, we wrote the book, everything, like, I mean, sitting in your room and looking at shadows and watching how the sun goes across the sky and watching a bird in the morning, you know, peck a worm out of a crack. All that is the same predatory aspect of a bird as you hunting as a bass eating and, you know, foraging. So that's where kind of it all started. And then people started asking me more crazy stuff and I gave them the crazy stuff. And they, they think it's crazy until they go out and they finally open their eyes. And I don't think it's crazy at all, man. I think it's genius. And I'm actually sitting here <laughs> rethinking how I fish for, for big predators because when I'm throwing baits, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm attacking structure, whatever that is, weed, be weed beds, edges of weeds, rock piles, points, drop-offs, whatever that might be. But I have never thought about what you just said there about getting the bait into a position where the predator is going to push it into a funnel. Now explain a little bit more about that to me. Cause I want, I want to, I want to, at about, at a, we're going to have to wrap this up and a lot quicker than what I was expecting. Cause I got to go bass fishing. <laughs> you are just like most of the people I watch. I watch a lot. You know, I see a lot, but I, I keep a lot to myself. You're like most anglers where you go down the bank and you target structure and cover elements. Mm -hmm. You see a rock and you throw out a rock or you see a weed line and you throw out a weed line. Throwing out a weed line, if you this is your weed line and you're here and you're throwing out a weed line, you know, they say your strike zone is only the first foot. Yeah. So once you make one crank and if you got, you know, the new uh, Akuma reel, you do one rind and you're bringing in 27 inches, you're already out of the strike zone. All right. So now you create a following system. So now the bass is going to follow your swim bait out towards your boat. You just reposition all the fish. So in one cast, you just killed 20 yards of your stretch. If you turn around and go, how are they going to eat a bluegill? Well, the bluegill is going to be parallel or within the weeds or the tulies that you're fishing. You know, or they're going to be one foot out. And when a bass comes out from the outside to eat them, those, those bluegill are going to push into a tulie. And on your tule stretch, there's going to be a, we call them Fu Manchus. There's going to be a, a little clump of, bait, you know, brush out in front of it. Right. It creates a J hook. Well, that swim bait's going to come in to that J hook and do a directional chain go, oh crap, I'm stuck. And the bass is going, that's what the bass are expecting to see. That's how they eat. So when they see a directional change in a flare, the bass come up and go, Boop, and they eat it because it's in a funnel. It's like eating against a plate. So now when you go down that weed line now, now you're going to parallel and usually have your boat scraping the weeds and every little out clumping you see is a strike zone. That's going to enhance. So, I mean, you can. Now, now are you, sorry. So, and then on that point, on the Fu Manchu, on the plate. Yeah. You make a directional change too. Do you throw a belly in your line? You, and, yeah. And, and that's the great thing. Like when you do um, say the hydroglide, you're going to throw the hydroglide liter literally one foot off of the Thule line. But, you know, between you and your cast, there's a clump that comes out. So mm -hmm. you got a directional, a funnel here on this side. You got the front part of the funnel, which is the front part of that weed that comes out. So that's technically a point. And then you got the backside. So when you do your hydroglide coming up to this and a bass is pushing that swim bait into a place to, to ambush, because you're looking through the bass's eyes, you're not looking through your eyes anymore. When that hydroglide gets up there, then I'll do a directional change. I go pop, pop, and that thing's going to flare because the bass is going, oh, I've got this guy pinned. Now he's scared. Now he's not going to be able to run straight away for me. He's going to flare up in the water column or turn, and that's where you see the bass come in and go like this and suck in and eat it. So I'll do a directional change before that. Then I'll bring the, it, the, the glide bait will come out to the front part. I'll do a directional change on this side, and then hopefully get the bait to come on this side. So I'll do three strike zones in one cast off one little teeny, you know, brush clump. And I got, and, and I'm telling you, when you start looking at that, it changes everything. And it, it's, it's more than that. It's shadows. It's, 
I'll give you an example. And here's how crazy it is. I see your ducks in the back. I'm going to tweak your mind a little bit. So this is what we're doing at Fish Lab. This is why Mike and I are going to be able to bring stuff that I think no other company is going to bring. We're going to see things in a whole new light. <clears throat> so you duck hunt, right? <laughs> to say the least, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> People don't know I, I did that. I used to shoot for the fire department uh, Olympics for oh, travel. Wow. So I, I did that, I archery shot. So I did all this stuff. So you go out in the morning, you throw your, your deeks out there, but when you get over in your little, you're blind. Early morning, sun's breaking up, you're sitting there, you're looking across the water, you see your ducks, you're calling, back, 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 doing that whole thing. And all of a sudden, you see a shadow go like this across the water. And I know you've seen it because now you're in that, you are the bass. All right, all right. So you see a shadow and instantaneously you look at the shadow and you're going, where's the sun at? You're going to go, the sun's over in my left-hand corner. You're going to look up and you're going to look up in the sky and you're going to look for the duck because the duck is pr pr producing yeah. a shadow right. a quarter of a mile or a hundred feet or 50 feet in front of them. You look at the shadow, you come up, you see the bird, you, you take your lead and you drop your duck. You never saw your duck. You saw the shadow of the duck, which <laughs> put you in position to come up, find the duck, do your point, lead, follow through, and drop it. You know, bass do the same thing. Yeah, and and this is this is crazy because so many times when you're fishing frogs and even wake baits, they hit it before it even hits the water. Sometimes, like they see the shadow coming, right? Yeah, they follow the shadow, and I've yeah. literally seen it. So when you're working a swim bait, say the hydroglide, you know, or the biogill, and you understand where your shadows are, your sun. And you can not only work the top of the water column, but you could create a shadow two, three, four, 20, 25 feet underwater and know where that place is there. So if a fish is down 15 feet under a tree, he's wearing a hat, he can't yep. see this. But all of a sudden he sees a shadow going across the bottom, which is your bait that's 10 feet or 15 feet in front of him. He'll come out, he'll hit the shadow. I've seen him eat the shadows. Wow. And then he'll turn around and go, that was fake. And he'll look up and you watch the fish will come up and hit the fish. Bait. So what I'm saying is like what you're doing in hunting, you could change your whole thing around. Everything's going to mess you up now because you're going to go, wait a minute. Shadows have that big of effect, a bigger bait profile color. You know, does that, does that work more? Well, you're, you said you're a fly fisherman, right? Oh yeah. So if the sun's here and your position's here and your fish is here and you see a big rainbow trout, so when you fly cast and you throw upstream, one of the biggest things on mending is not as much people don't understand. It's not as much of the the line being in too much of a bow for the hook set. It's rolling a shadow over them. It's throwing the shadow. So if you ever see a trout where a, a shadow of a fishing line hits them, you'll see the trout do this. But if you see the shadow and you guys don't pay attention, you see the shadow of your, your bug, your woolly bugger, whatever you got up there, your horn bug, and the, the trout, you'll see the trout come out like this. It's eating the shadow of the bug mm -hmm. prior to. And it then sees it and goes and for them. Comes up and go, you guys haven't seen that. Oh. I've been seeing it for years. But that's why I've been my line fly fishing because I don't want the shadow of the line right. cross the eyes of the fish before the shadow of the bait does. Yeah. Right. And so, there's a, <laughs> uh, you're talking about, you know, relating all this when, when we're bone fishing, you know, when we're bone fishing on the flats, crystal clear water, it is just like duck hunting. You know, you put the, you get the, the sun at your back so you can see, you know, the, the flow of the water, whatever the tide's doing is, you know, most of the time you're wanting it at your back, but depending on the sun and the yeah. wind direction is key and seeing these things, finding feeding lanes, which is like a, a flyway kind of, it's right. funny. A lot of, there is a lot of crossover between the thought process of hunting ducks and hunting fish. Right. Yeah. It's weird. Like when you're, it's just completely different, but when you understand that, so like I said, when you bring in that category and then, you know, you probably archery shoot too, right? A little bit. The, I used to archery hunt a little bit, but the problem with archery hunting here, it's in August and August is a huge filming time for me. I'm always in Alaska for half the month. And so anyway, I, I muzzleloader hunt a lot. But like in archery, you, you have a system where if your bow overpowers your arrow, you've got too much energy going through the arrow and that's where you get the banana arrows. Right. 
So when you look at all these different categories, and this is what Mike Bennett and myself bring to this table, and you understand the system, that's why this is so wicked with Fish Lab, is now you have Akuma, where they have enough product where you can find the right setup, which is the right reel, mm -hmm. the right line, yep. the right rod to create a perfect balance system and now create the right bait. Like there's never been a time in the industry where we're going to have this, this unique time frame, this bubble where these anglers, Mike and I, crazy fishermen, all of the guys on the fish lab, you know, staff, the, you know, the, the uh, field promoters or however you want to call them, the, the, the engineers, the scientists that we have across the U.S., they're going to be able to put together systems at a price point and a design pattern and understanding how these fish eat that no one else, you know, no one else is going to be able to bring. And that's why I'm so excited when, when we talk about fishing and hunting and, and shadows and all this stuff, all this stuff goes back to what I'm looking at to help and bring to the table with Fish Lab and Mike and the team is because the next time you pick up a bait, the next time I saw, didn't you do a video recently with the bio shad? Um, um, it was, the, so yeah, so the way we did uh, the frog, we did one with the, the rattle toad. Um, we did one with the wake bait on small mouth and one with the wake bait on large mouth. So, three. so I, I think I just saw something with, cause I researching and I'm looking at YouTube and I saw you smoking some small mouth you know, doing directional change or doing the, the flutter yeah. on the surface. Uh, you know, I saw you doing that. And then when you bring it across, well, those smallmouth are no different. Uh, like when you're fishing, I'm looking at, oh, he's throwing here, the sun's behind it at this angle, you know, on this corner, because you're filming this, the shadow is going this direction. You're probably fishing a little grass edge. So yeah. there's all these things in play. And now you have a bait that performs right, creates the right shadow, the, the sounds, the frequencies, the pitch and you know how it's swimming to create a, a bigger profile and then all of a sudden you start seeing these smallies smoking the bait <laughs> yeah that's what you get to enjoy as a fisherman you know and that's what we're trying to bring to everybody else is and one of the one of the things that you guys have done which fish lab has done with those wake baits specifically you have made a bait that is simple stupid to run you guys you know fish lab has built those wake baits to where you literally if you don't want to even think about it, you can throw it out there and just reel it in and you will catch a bunch of fish. If you start getting into it, like us whack jobs do, and you start figuring out different ways to run it and, and, you know, different ways that they're attracting fish. But the last year, when they first came out with the, that biogill um, wake bait uh, here locally, the, the big bass were keyed into bluegill, I mean, and crappie. It was amazing how effective those baits were. They blew my mind to start with. And then this year we started using the, uh, um, the bio shad, you know, wake baits, because, um, if you watch that video, we actually took the sexy shad and I took a Sharpie and made it look like a perch. Cause they, they're full of four inch perch. That's what they're eating, which is exactly what that bait is. <laughs> they were crushing it. Well, and you can see the what you have right there. <clears throat> you're the prime example of somebody excited about fishing. You know, you're no different than what we're doing over at Fish Lab. And, and our job is to be able to get those baits, like you say. And you don't want to say, you know, keep it simple, stupid. But if you do build a bait right, that most baits, when you look at it, there's only a handful of techniques out there. You know, you're either walking the dog. So you're doing a manual movement. You're doing a me mechanical movement with a bill. And you work in a water column, which is either top, middle, bottom. So you're dragging a jig on the bottom, or you're walking a bait or a buzz bait on the surface. Every, mechanics are really simplistic when you look at techniques, but when you have the right tools, that's the difference. When you can put a tool and it fits perfectly in that lane, where you can basically throw it out and chunk and wind and catch fish from a one pound smallie to a 10 pound largemouth to a, a 25 pound red, you know, right. that. That's the cool part about it. And that's what I love about fishing. And, you know, definitely I'm, I'm really grateful being part of Fish Lab and Akuma and Soft Steel is they're able, they're able to let me start thinking and <laughs> getting excited again and, you know, sleepless nights and calling Mike up and going, Mike, I got an idea. <laughs> Bill, it's two o'clock. He, Mike, yeah, Mike de technically should be with us this morning, but I've been calling him all night long. <laughs> 
I kept him kept up. Him and awake, he, yeah. He sleep. He's like, that guy never sleeps. But that's, what, that's what we're doing on that part. And I say, I'm pretty excited about it. And what we're doing from this year, like, you know, Mike came out with, and the guys over at, uh, you know, Fish Lab with the Slamamander, you know, and this is one of the big things over at the show at ICAST. Everything that they've done the last few years, I mean, is the lanes that they have approached from inshore, offshore, and freshwater is just the start. Hold on to your horses. <laughs> Hold on to your horses. Let's uh, see the Slamamander. I want to see it real quick. Oh, dude, this thing is a slick little deal, four and a half, six inch, and seven inch. Now, the Slamamander wow. represents what we used to call back in the day a water dog. So I fished water dogs in the 80s and early 90s for years for monster bass. And people did it all over the U.S. But, but they were alive. You could actually buy them for. Oh, they are cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, they sat there and their, their little gills flared out and stuff. And you pin them on a jig head or just split shot. And you caught big fish. And what happens just with regulations and everything with bait fish, you know, they you know, we haven't been able to fish them for 10 years or so. But big fish, and we're talking monster stripers, the largemouth, the big catfish, they all still know this bait. They're right. still in the waterways. Right. And the cool thing about it is it's basically from everybody really getting in that swim bait craze, a boot right. tail type swim bait to a creature bait. You know, Fish Lab basically last year knocked it out of the park. I know they've been working on this for a few years, but this can be used on a Carolina rig. You could put a big, you know, swing head jig on it. Um, you can put a big uh, owner beast hook in it, which I like because weight transfer system being underneath it with the, that owner hook, this actually, when you throw it in the water, it will swim and kick like a live water dog, which freaked me out when Mike showed up. Like, <laughs> like, dude, you couldn't have, talking about a guy who knows how to fish water dogs, you guys could have knocked it out of the park any further on that. Wow. And I looked at it and the cool thing is, is if you want to go to the bottom, you flip this over if you do big heavy texas rig or a swing edge jig and when you flip a, jig, a bait over like this and the boot tail is upward it still creates a high low pressure system this thing is still going to swim and kick across the bottom so mechanically remember we were talking about tools and techniques yeah got a bait that follows falls in so many different techniques and how you could fish it it just becomes more productive oh so the, for sure that's like, insane Big small mouth to large mouth. So yeah, yeah. Like, everything we're gonna do as a team is is awesome. But like I said, I'm new here. I'm the new guy. Um, you're well, new. You're new to the team, but you're not new to building baits by any stretch or big fish. So yeah, I'm I'm a wacko there. But what they've done, like I said, what Fish Lab and Akuma and, and uh, Soft Still have done in the last few years, you know, and Akuma's been around for 25 plus years. I mean, they've been around forever. Um, just wait. I mean, things are going to blow up pretty quick i'm pretty <laughs> yeah i'm excited i know i've been i've been uh, looking for the next bait to do some videos on and go fish because it's just it is it's just that much fun right checking yeah. out the new stuff and oh there, oh drawing board hey I, I, I can't show it too yeah much, no 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 this thing, all these right here that yeah i'm not showing you nothing yeah no no but this is just this is just in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so people, you know, whoever's listening on the podcast that's not watching this on YouTube, he showed me a stack of papers about an inch and a half deep, full of drawings that I can't see. And now I'm and I, and I I'm about ready to drive to California and have a and, meeting. And I know Mike's right now going, "Don't show them." <laughs> <don't show> <laughs> like, like I get it, I get to tease, but you know what? We're, we're going to bring out. And another thing is, is the BBZ line, the, the baits I've worked on and designed for 15 years. Um, people are looking for them right now. So don't fret. Everything that I've designed for the last 15 years, we're going to bring back in Fish Lab. And we're actually, I'm increasing, I'm, I'm building even a better mousetrap, which is surprisingly because I'm anal. Like when I come out with stuff, it's as best as I can make it. We're actually coming out with full lines of BBZs. We're going to start working on them now. That all that's going to be under the Fish Lab uh, brand. And the swim baits, the rats, fat flies, all that stuff's coming. So Sweet. hold on. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. Well, I uh, I mean, I can't. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up, Bill, because 
If I keep I, going, I, I, see, you, I see your heads like I'm ready to go fish. I'm so so excited. But if I if I keep, I love this stuff. This is I absolutely love these talks. And if I keep going, I know it's going to end up being three hours long, and nobody's yeah. going to listen anymore. So here's here's what we're going to do. Everybody out there listening, we are going to circle back um, and, and talk again with Bill and uh, get Mike on the horn here and, and talk about stuff. But Definitely reach out to us and let us know um, what you want to know about the the new Fish Lab stuff. And, you know, maybe Bill Seamantle uh, in general, like we'll, got some questions for him. Let us know and and uh, we'll do this again. But, oh, my gosh, uh, my head is spinning. And, uh, and, you know, you bring up a good point. Anybody that has a question, everybody over at Fish Lab, Davey, um, you know, Mike Bennett, myself, um, Mark Rogers, and all of the team. We're hardcore fishermen, and we understand if you have a question that's important, we're going to get back to you. Yeah, everybody exactly. Knows everybody, and everybody knows how to get to us. You know? Fish Lab and Okuma have done a great job of doing the Tune Up Tuesdays and all the stuff that helps. The super simple, most simple questions that you could have, they probably tackled it at some point. So that's a great resource as well. But oh man, I'm uh, I'm excited to go fishing now. But thanks. I hate you. Because you're gonna go fishing, and I'm sitting here working on lures. Yeah, uh, I'm not honestly. I, if, if you truth be known, I uh, I own a big mini storage facility here in town. I've actually got to go get ready for a, an auction, and I've got some proposals to send for fishing. And so I'm actually not gonna go fish if it makes you feel any better. But maybe I tomorrow. A, I have a funny feeling if you have one of those containers and they got fishing gear in it, you're gonna be the highest bidder. Don't lie to me. Yeah. I don't know. I know you're like, okay, this one I'm going to just make my own. <laughs> Dude, this year especially, I'm like, you know, I actually did just open one up that I have to sell. There is some fishing stuff in there. I was like, oh, that, that rooster tail is worth about 50 bucks. <laughs> Can't find it anywhere. That's worth some money. Oh, damn it. Well, that took a turn for the worst. Anyway, thanks for joining us, everybody. This week's episode of Wild Fish Wild Places Behind the Scenes. Bill C. Mantle, just a genius in the industry. And, uh, Working for Fish Lab and Okuma. I can't wait to do more stuff with them. And we're definitely going to be doing another win of these. So thanks, Bill, for joining us. You got it. Have a great day, everybody.